Well, hey, good morning and God bless you. Welcome to Wabash Church. It's a joy to come into your home and spend some time with you this morning. And I just want to say that I miss you guys. And I can't wait to see you again once this whole coronavirus situation is all over. You know, one thing I love about this church is that it's all about Jesus at this church. And, and while the world has been all about politics and conflict, we still have a place that's all about Jesus. And now I invite you to forget about all that drama going, out, going on out in our culture and just take a break from all that for one hour. Let's focus on Jesus. As we transition into worshiping him, I want to remind you that God has prepared a place for us in his kingdom to be with him forever. And while it's important that we participate in earthly systems of government, God's word says that we are citizens of his kingdom, first and foremost. We are meant for eternity, and God's word says that as Christians, we're simply passing through this world into our heavenly home. The Bible says it this way in, in Hebrews 13, 14. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is to come. Let's do that. Let's seek that city. While the culture is still hyper-focused on earthly government, let's take an hour and focus on the city and the kingdom that is to come as we sing to our King. Amen? Amen. Let's sing. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of the deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone and I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God and I'm no longer a slave child of God From my mother's womb you have chosen me and love has called my name and I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins and i'm no longer a slave to fear i am a child of god i'm no longer a slave child of God, oh, 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 you split the sea so I can walk right through it, my fears will drown in perfect love. So I could stand and sing I am a child of God You split the sea So I could walk right through it My fears would drown in perfect love You rescued me So I could stand and sing I am a child of God and I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God and I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems Hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. In Christ the shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne in christ the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch's treasure. How great turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many into glory behold upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mom 
mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have been my why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. His wounds have been my It's me, Miss Lindsay, and our friend Susie. Hi, everybody. Hi, Susie. So have you been liking the Bible stories that Megan and Jesse have been telling us? I like them so much. Oh, good. I'm glad. Have you noticed anything that they all have in common? Yeah, in the stories, somebody always needs help, and Jesus always comes and helps them. You're right, Susie. The Bible is full of tons of stories about Jesus helping people in need. Mm -hmm. What's that you have in your hand there? Oh, it's an empty snow box. Oh, hmm. What are you gonna do with it? Well, every year my Grammy and me, we go fill it up with things for little kids that might need special things like toys or just special things for them. Oh, like for Operation Christmas Child. Yeah. You know what? Just like the Bible stories we've been hearing where Jesus is helping others, you know, the Bible tells us to share the love of Jesus by helping others too. And you know, sending these shoe boxes to people in need is a great way to do that. Hmm, guess it is. Yeah, and our church is doing that again this year too. But you know what I was thinking? I was thinking that sending toys is just one way we can help and that there are so many other ways that we can help too. Like what? Well, like this Christmas catalog, this Christmas gift catalog has all different sorts of ways we can help. Hmm. Like you can buy a family a goat and it would feed them milk, or you can buy them chickens and the chicken would give them eggs. You could buy them fruit trees, or you can send them medical supplies or pay for medical bills. There's all different kinds of ways we can help. Wow, that would help them for a long time too. Yeah. Like sometimes I get toys and I love them, but I get a little bored of them sometimes. But I'm always hungry. <laughs> I know, Susie. Kids are always hungry. So this year I was thinking along with the shoe boxes that we could maybe see how much money we can collect too and see all the other ways that we can help people in need. 
Oh, that'd be so cool. So if you all would like to help this year, grab a shoebox or make a donation. You can make a donation online or else we'll have a donation box near the shoe boxes. You can do that too. And I can't wait to see what Jesus can do through Wabash this year. So collection week is November 22nd. So we have two weeks to see what we can do. I can't wait to go shopping with my Grammy and fill up my box and see how much money is in my piggy bank. Mm, me too, Susie. Isn't it fun to help others in the name of Jesus? So fun. Yeah, let's pray. Okay. Dear Lord, we just love you so much and we just are so thankful for everything that you give to us and everything you do for us, Lord. And we just pray that we could give back to others, Lord. And I just thank you for all the opportunities that you give to us to help be your hands and feet, Lord. And even though you don't need us, you ask us to partner with you, Lord. And I just pray that this season and always, Lord, that we would just always be looking for ways to share the love of Jesus with others, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bye, everybody. Bye. I hope we get it by a goat. Would you join me now as we turn our hearts to God in prayer? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning, first of all, praising you for your goodness. We know of your character, and we know that you are righteous and that your loving kindness endures forever. We're grateful, and we, like the psalmist, praise your holy name. In your great love for us, you sent your son Jesus to die on our behalf. Your word reminds us that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the godly for the ungodly. And so we praise your holy name. Our country is in need of your touch and your healing. Bridge the gaps that exist in our land and convict us of our need to be one nation which is united under you. Would you heal the divisions that exist? For the many that still suffer due to this pandemic and those that are fighting other related illnesses and maladies, bring to them healing. For those striving to find an effective treatment and those seeking to develop a vaccine, give them wisdom from on high. We seek to follow your directives, O Lord, and we pray and make intercession for all of those in authority over us, from the most local of government officials to the president and his cabinet. May they all be given wisdom and discernment as they lead. Might they model the righteous behavior that is befitting the office which they hold. And now, Father, as your word is opened in our hearing, may our lives be changed and might we reflect your glory to a hurting world. And may we do so in the name whose name is above every name, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I once was told that a good sermon begins with a good introduction and ends with a great conclusion. In fact, it was described like a smooth airline flight. A flight that is deemed great is when you take off and your landing is smooth as silk and your cruising is uninterrupted by any turbulence at all. A good sermon takes off great, it's smooth and lands the same way. And as you cruise through the message, there are no bumps in a good message. Sorry, today's sermon, the beginning of which may not seem like a smooth takeoff. In fact, I'm just going to jump into what I see as a complaint lodged against God in this morning's text. No smooth taxi or gentle lift here. We're jumping right in. We're currently looking at the Psalms of Lament. And this morning, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm number 10. And as you're turning there, I want to ask you a couple of questions which might launch us, after all, on this sermon flight, if you will. Where do you perceive God to be when you face difficult situations? What's God doing when you're being treated unjustly? When the wicked seem to prosper and you've gotten the short end of the stick in life, what's God doing? And how do you approach him in times like this? These appear to be the very questions raised by the psalmist in the opening verses of chapter 10. 
Why, O Lord, do you stand far away, he asks. Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? He begins with what seems like a complaint. And catch the gravity of his complaint here. It's not something like, hey, God, this kind of slipped by you. No, this seems like an insinuation that God is intentionally ignoring what's happening. He's standing far away, after all. He's actually hiding the words that are used. That implies a willful action. And it's not even the trouble that is preoccupying him here. It's the father's avoidance of any help. You know, Martin Luther once wrote the following about this very verse. He said, it's not the trouble, but the hiding of the father's face, which cuts us to the quick. So just what's going on here? These questions begin yet another psalm that we refer to here as one of the 50-plus psalms of lament. And this particular one begins with some fairly strong accusations of God's seemingly willful disinterest in the welfare of his child. At least, that's what it feels like to the writer. Now, last week we saw that many of the psalms of lament begin with a sense of crying aloud to God. This week, we see that same crying out, but here, it's mixed with a complaint, which is difficult for us to take, if we're honest. Kind of rubs us the wrong way to think that complaining to God is somehow okay. What I want you to see this morning is that this kind of complaining is going to eventually lead us to a Godward resolution. But that journey begins in the messy world of complaint. This kind of transparency with God is central to the Psalms of Lament. It gives us the chance to voice our hard questions. God, it seems that you're way over there and the problem is right here. God, why have you ducked around the corner of this one? Just what's happening here? And what is happening doesn't seem to align well with who you are. In fact, Lord, here's what I'm facing. Let me paint for you the portrait of the wicked. And that's what comes next in this psalm. Here's what characterizes the wicked, he might say. And he begins with arrogance in verse 2. Arrogance fuels their pursuit of the poor. And not only are they arrogant, but the wicked are boastful. They're greedy and they're blasphemous. Note in verse 3, For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. Now it's apparent in verse 4 that there's a total disregard for God on this part of the wicked. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. And here's the problem, Lord. In spite of all of this arrogance and pride, he still seems to prosper. And isn't that oftentimes the root of what really troubles us? In circumstances such as these, when the wicked or the arrogant prosper or do well, it's like salt in the wound. Not only am I being mistreated by one who's completely godless, but that person also seems to be winning. It's no wonder he says what he does way back in verse 1. God, do you see all of this? This is Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1 all over again. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? And as this portrait of the wicked continues to unfold, verse 6 shows us the egocentrism of the wicked. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. I've got this, the wicked seems to say. It's all about me. 
Now, he's also profane in his speech, we're told. In verse 7, it says, His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. Which makes sense since our words simply are a mirror of our heart condition. And we've already seen that his heart is arrogant and prideful. Jesus said this very same thing in Matthew 12, 34. There he said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now this portrait continues. He's con conniving as well in verses 8 and 9. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws them into his net. All of this, and he labors under the false impression that God's clueless. Look in verse 11. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Oh, the arrogance of one who would believe that he's outwitted God. Now, let me just pause here for just a moment, because that was really a boatload of yuck. The portrait of the wicked is everything you can imagine in a completely godless and arrogant subject. And then... Some, with all of this, he asks, Lord, where are you? May I ask you this this morning? Is this you and your life right now? Perhaps the number one question on your mind right now is, Lord, just where are you in all of this? Have you been watching, Lord? Has any of this escaped your gaze? Can I expect resolution soon? Well, don't miss this next section because it's here that we need to go after enumerating all of this. It's here that complaint becomes intercession. And to keep us from arrogance, our complaint must always turn to intercession. Verse 12 begins with this word, arise, O Lord. Arise is an imperfect here, or excuse me, an imperative here. It's imperative, Lord, that you arise. And the word was often used like you think it would be used, to stand from a sitting or kneeling position. But in addition, I like to think that this is God seated on his throne, and then he stands up because he hears the cry of his child. Your agony has reached his ears. Next, the psalmist prays, lift up your hand. This is an idiom for strength, much like his strong right hand was when we spoke last week. Lift up your hand and display your strength. Forget not the afflicted, he says. And this stands in stark opposition to the claim that the wicked had earlier when he said that God is forgotten. In verse 11, show him it's not true, Lord. You've not forgotten the afflicted. And now verse 13 might be phrased like this. Why would you do that? It, it's, it's a question aimed at the arrogant. He asks, why would you renounce God and think that he won't hold you accountable? In verse 14, he answers his own question with a statement again about God. But you do see, he says, for you note mischief and vexation. Mischief here in the Hebrew can also mean drudgery. The sense of it here is that, God, you do see the oppressed and those who labor under heavy labor, and you see vexation or spite. Here, the word is akin to provocation, the sorrow that one causes another, oftentimes with tears. This is the psalmist saying, you see how beaten down I am and how I've been provoked. You see it so that you can eradicate it by taking it into your hands. The helpless come to you, O Lord, because you are the helper of the fatherless, he says. Break the arm of the wicked, he says in verse 15. End 
their strength, in other words. He's not actually asking God to break this individual's arm. But the arm is a sign of strength. And so he's saying, end his strength, Lord, and call his wickedness to account until he's purged of it, he says in verse 15. So thus far, the psalmist has lodged his complaint. He's painted the portrait of the wicked. He's allowed his complaint to lead him to intercession. And finally, now he's going to wrap up this psalm of lament with an affirmation of God's attentive rule. He first says, the rule of God, king forever and ever, the nations perish from his land. Here, the psalmist again is recalling the past victories of God. He has banished from the land its past cruel enemies, such as the Canaanites. And so God's track record here is informing the psalmist. And the psalmist's declaration here is that he calls to mind God's attentiveness. And in verse 17, you will hear the desire of the afflicted, he says. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. In other words, God hears. And in verse 18, God acts. God acts to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. This phrase, who is of the earth, is just another way of pointing out the very temporal nature of man. It highlights that we are but dust, and to dust we shall return, as it's said in Genesis chapter 3. So what started out with a distant and retiring God now comes full circle to a God who's living and active, who's hearing, and who's acting. So where in this progression do you find yourself today? Are you back in verses 1 and 2 Praying your complaint to God? Or perhaps you're painting the portrait of the wicked. You're filling in the colors of evil. This trouble that has befallen you. Or maybe you've left that and you're now crying out to God in prayer. Your complaint has now turned to intercession. Or perhaps you're on the other side of it all now. And you're rejoicing in God's attentive rule. Wherever you are, just remember this fact. Lament needs always to lead us to prayer, which then leads us to the throne. And there's nothing wrong with lament. Obviously, they're in the scriptures. They're there for us. But I don't think God's intent was that we would remain there. Let your lament lead you to the one who is mighty who is righteous, and who is just, whose attentive rule is over all. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you are not far off, and that even in those moments when you seem unattainable to us, we know that you're there, that you're watching, that you see the wicked, and that you are mighty to act. Lord, impart to us the strength that we need to be patient and to wait for you to act on our behalf. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I Oh
forsaken take me jesus take me now i surrender all and i surrender all and all to thee my blessed savior i surrender all and all to jesus i surrender lord i give myself to thee fill me with thy love and power let thy blessings fall on I surrender all. I surrender all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Well, thank you for joining us for this online service. We're glad that you were a part of what God is doing here through Wabash. Now, as we move into an Advent season, we have a special opportunity to gather together and do something a little bit different. So this Advent series, we're going to be replacing our weekly devotional. And on Thursday evenings, we're gonna be gathering in a special online service where we will sing carols, we will make crafts, we will hear the stories of Jesus' birth and be together this season. So if you want to be a part of that series, we want you to sign up at wabashchurch.org slash advent. And the reason we want you to sign up is because each week we are going to be hand-delivering a package to you. One that includes some snacks, the craft supplies, and a small gift from us. We want to celebrate God's presence in our lives this Advent season together. So we want to have you there. So if you join us, please go to wabashchurch.org slash Advent and make sure to sign up by November 22nd. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Go in peace today, church. We'll see you next time. And all to Jesus I surrender, Lord. I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power, let thy blessings fall on me and I surrender all I surrender all I'll to thee my blessed Savior I surrender